In a time when people are thinking eco-friendly, Brianna Cox introduces a fun way some New Mexicans are getting around. And it's a sport that pits two fighters against each other in a mixed martial arts battle. Sofia De Conte shows us what cage fighting is all about. I'm Brianna Cox. And I'm Ryan Hardwick. All these stories and more on this edition of Campus Reports. Local coverage. Student perspectives. At the University of New Mexico. From the KNME Studios. This is Campus Report. Cage fighting, a mixed martial arts sport that's being called one of the fastest growing sports in the world. Sofia DeCani takes a closer look at a local training gym. Fighters in Training, No Holds Barred is a local gym for amateur and professional cage fighters. Arlene Sanchez Vaughn, an owner and trainer, along with her husband, says this sport began from the ground up, literally. It's something that has actually grown from the streets and now that people have actually been able to get more technical with it. Cage fighting is a growing sport that has gained much popularity in recent years. But what exactly does this sport offer that makes it so different than other sports? Professional fighter Carlos Condit says it's a variety of sports. A combination of uh, boxing, kickboxing, uh, submission grappling or jiu-jitsu, um, wrestling, um, sometimes people incorporate some karate, um, some, some different stuff. This combination sport in a cage can also be called a free sport, Vaughn says, which she believes makes it so popular and entertaining. So many weapons involved. It's not like the game of boxing where you only have two weapons. There's many variables. The hands, the feet, the knees, the elbows, you're on your back. You can submit somebody. There's just so many ways to, to win a fight. Albuquerque has many up-and-coming fighters who can't get enough of the adrenaline rush this sport has to offer. FIT NHB fighter Cody Ox Willer says that's why he loves to do it. There's no rules, really. There's rules, but to an extent, you know? But you basically get in there and do your thing. You can punch, knee, elbow, choke, break stuff. I asked some of the fighters how they got involved in such a raw and ruthless sport. Gerald Lovato, a FIT NHB fighter who recently went pro in November, says it basically just fell into his lap. Uh, I actually just started to get in shape and uh, it kind of just uh, ended up to where I got good and, and now I'm fighting. While others, like Cote Ox Willer, just love to fight and even better, love to win. You know, the victory is the addicting part. It's, there's so. no feeling like it, you know, it's just like something that no one can take away from you. and. You know, it's just something that you accomplish by yourself. You go in that cage alone, you come out alone. Both amateurs and professionals are addicted to this mixed martial arts sport. So what makes a strong fighter? Vaughn says it's more than just discipline. The, the best fighter is a fighter that's full circle. Somebody that's been able to do all of the, art, the arts, which is boxing, Thai boxing, which is the elbows and the knees, and the kicks, and also the grappling or the wrestling skills. Carlos Conde is one local professional FIT NHB fighter who is currently training for a world title fight on March 24th in Las Vegas, Nevada. Conde says he is looking forward to it. My goal right now is kind of to, to build myself as a fighter and build my team and uh, build my school and just put, put our school on the map. And others, like Gerald Lovato, not only enjoy the sport but are also happy about its growth and popularity. Mixed martial arts is... Uh Everybody's calling it the fastest growing sport, you know, in the world right now. And uh, I mean, it's, you know, getting very popular all over the world. So uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty glad to be a part of it. So what kind of background do they need to get into this cage fighting deal? Um, actually, all the fighters that I met, they actually come from a lot of different backgrounds. Some just come from street fighting all the way to um, one of them who had been fighting mixed martial arts since he was a very young little boy. So it just depends. Were they intimidating to be around? Um, no, they're cute. <laughs> I wasn't um, in so what was, what's the process like for them to get into cage fighting? Like, is there an application process? How do they go through? No, they actually just start training, and um, actually, it's rel it's rather easy for them to get a fight. Um, obviously, you start off amateur, and um, basically, as soon as you're ready for a fight, you can usually find one. You know, there's other gyms that are always looking for their fighters to fight someone, so it's basically just start training and if you think you're ready you go in there and 
give See it a shot. Happens? Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So how did how did you get inside? How did you get to interview all these guys and see? Um, well, them? actually, I just went to one of their practices. I wanted to learn a little bit more about um, why they do it, what they enjoy about it, and they were all, you know, willing to talk about why they do it, and they love what they do. Did you try and take one of them? <laughs> they don't. They know I could take them any day. <laughs> they didn't no even know problem. not to mess with me. <laughs> Oh, thank you for being here, Sophie. It sounds like it was a fun trip. You may see pink flamingos at the Rio Grande Zoo, but how about on stage? To explain, our own Blaze Aldrich sits down with one of these flamingos. All right, well, I want to first start off by asking you, Ryan, uh, who are the pink flamingos and what are they known for? The pink flamingos are a band, and what they're known for is playing gigs for the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, you know, if they have a Christmas party or if they have some sort of event that they need celebration and entertainment for, you know, that's what the band is. So that's what we provide is entertainment for the Fortune 500 companies. Where do you all, where do you play at usually? Very rarely do we do gigs here locally in New Mexico. The majority of the gigs is in the continent, continental U.S. Uh, we just did a gig in Las Vegas um, and then we have one coming up in Houston. Also all over the world, um, we're going to Bangkok pretty soon, you know, in Thailand. We're also, uh, they play in France, uh, Germany, I mean, just all over the place, all over the world, really, um, wherever there's a need for an entertainment. That's cool. How'd you, how'd you get the chance to play with the Pink Flamingos? The jazz community here in New Mexico has what we know as jam sessions, where there's a house band, and pretty much anybody who has an instrument can go up and play. And so I've been attending those jam sessions for, since I was a junior in high school, and i just been keep going up, you know, I'd shed, work on all my licks and all, all the things that I had to do to be a good trumpet player. And pretty soon, uh, the house leader, his name is Stu McCaskey, he comes up to me and he says, well, I know this band, they're looking for a trumpet player, would you like to play with them? And I was like, well, what are they? And he told me, you know, they're called the Pink Flamingos, they, they play all over the world, you know, it's a great opportunity. And I said, you know, sure, no problem, I'd love to do that. And so that's how I got the gig, and I've been doing it for about two months now. Um, so how long have they been around for? As far as I know, they've been around about 20 plus years. I've asked them, you know, they said, oh, we got started back in the early 80s, so pretty long time. <laughs> All right. Uh, how often do you get the chance to play with them? That depends. It varies from month to month. Uh, when I first got the call, I did one gig with them, and that was in December. Uh, no gigs in January, and then now that's February started, I just did three, I've done three gigs with them, and then we have another four coming up next month. So it's, it's pretty extensive, pretty extensive. Do you see yourself playing with them a lot in the summertime, probably? I'm hoping. It's, you know, it's, it's good money, so I'm hoping I can have a lot, of, a lot of cash for this summer. So yeah, I do hope to play for them. It's all about going green, reducing our carbon footprint, and helping the Earth last longer. That's what New Mexico officials are trying to do to reduce the effects of global warming. I recently discovered how going electric is working for Albuquerque. Yeah, for the C and J I actually feel like a, uh, a warrior on it. Modern chariot. <laughs> a happy cop's a, a well-working cop. You may have seen these futuristic machines around town before, but just in case, they're called Segways. And these graceful, off-roading, no-gas-needed gadgets have been a big hit with the Albuquerque Police Department since last October. And working from the downtown area at 3rd and Copper, we go all the way up to 10th Street, and then sometimes we even run up to the uh, I-25. And you can use them for a whole day and they use no, nothing but electricity. Not to mention the fact Segway owners say these little speed demons are virtually no maintenance. They're considered uh, zero maintenance machines, so you really only have to check the air pressure and plug it in. As long as it's got juice, it, it should work. They, we don't have any problems like with repairs or anything like that. People bring them back. We're a service center, but we never see anybody after. We're kind of like the Maytag man. You know, we sell them the Segway and they go on about their business. With two horsepowers per wheel, a max speed of 12 and a half miles per hour, and an impeccable turning radius, not even APD could resist. It makes it better than having to get in a car, start it up, waste that fuel. You know, you can have that thing inside your living room, unplug it, start it up, and, and get just about anywhere downtown. But these rider-ready segways aren't all business. <laughs> That's good. Can six drive these? Yeah, they can, they can drive them just fine. Just about anybody can ride it. It was With time to put these facts oh to the test. <laughs> this is a segway. These are two and a half inch heels. And we're going. Where are we going? 
and we're off. Yes, ladies, you can ride these in heels. As for the guys... Do you get chicks when you're on the Segway? Heck yeah, without a problem. <laughs> and if you're feeling a little height impaired, these electronic rides can give you the boost you've been looking for. I'm 5'8", and you get on top of that thing and you feel like, like a basketball player, you know, you're way up there. If you're really eager for more than just the usual attention you get when you're cruising on one of these bizarre rides, check out the accessories. If you move the machine while it's in lock mode, uh, you can do a lot of stuff. You can put spinners on them and paint them. We have multi-chrome paints and stuff like that to make them stand out. Nobody wants something just like the next guy, so. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Oh, that was perfect. Well, Brandon, that was a fun and entertaining story, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it was fun. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> I bet. Now, tell me a little bit about riding in the heels. Oh, that was good. That yeah? was really good. And you know, it wasn't as hard to balance as I thought it would be, but I did puncture like the little floorboard where you stand oh. with my heels, so that, that was no good. <laughs> <laughs> now, if someone wants to purchase these, how much do they run? They're going to run you about $5,000, um, but you know, for a high-end bike, you're going to pay about the same right. thing, so they're they're pretty nice, um, but that $5,000 does not include like those spinners or the rims or anything. So any those are just all accessories stuff. pretty yeah. much then? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. And um, now since they don't use gas or anything, now what kind of power source do they use and how long would it, how long would it last? You plug them in, they charge for about um, eight hours and they'll last you for 24 miles. When we were on them, we rode all the way up to this park and back and it was a nice long ride and they didn't run out or anything. So they'll last, they last APD pretty much the whole day. Well, great. And uh, if people are interested in this, where can they go to find some more information? They can go to SegwayNewMexico.com and they can actually check out the videos that they have there, too. They have a little more off-roading kind of thing. All things. right. Great. Well, thank you, Brianna. Thanks. That's all for this edition of Campus Reports. Join us next time for a fresh newscast with new anchors. We will still be here working behind the scenes to bring you new stories. I'm Ryan Hardway. And I'm Brianna Cox. Be safe on those segways.